the, the engagements. I, and by the way, there's a critique about the anthropological community when we first brought in the security. Hilton and uh, Kelly wrote to people in anthropology. is to investigate what the issues are first, rather. But it, it, so it was an interesting, I, I reflect on this. Hello everybody, welcome, welcome <laughs> to today's colloquium. Um, next week, um, Julie Kleinman will be speaking on borders in the capital, migration, race, and public space in Paris. But for now, please um, welcome to the podium Emmanuel Akyumpong. He's professor of history and of African and African American studies, and he's the faculty director for the Center of African Studies here at Harvard. Uh, good afternoon, and it is my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Adam uh, Habib, uh, Vice Chancellor of WITS. Uh, Adam Habib is an academic, researcher, activist, administrator, and renowned political commentator and columnist. A professor of political science, uh, Adam has over 30 years of academic, research, and administrative expertise spanning five universities and multiple local and international institutions, boards, and task teams. His professional involvement in institutions has always been defined by three distinct engagements, the contest of ideas, their translation into actionable initiatives, and the building of institutions. Adam Habib is currently the Vice Chancellor and Principal of Wits University, He's also the chair of University South Africa, which represents vice chancellors in higher education in the country. In these roles, he has been working with government, students, and other stakeholders to find solutions to the recent wave of protests around funding for higher education. He has also focused on building African research excellence, and together with the University of Cape Town, initiated the African Research Universities Alliance, or ARUA. Prior to joining WITS, Adam served as Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Innovation, Library, and Faculty Coordination at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in transforming the University of Johannesburg following nationwide mergers of tertiary institutions in 2005, and played a key role in increasing research output. He also served as research director on governance and democracy and executive director at the Human Sciences Research Council. He held several academic and research posts at the University of Natal, including professor in the School of Development Studies and research director of the Center for Civil Society. Adam holds qualifications in political science from three universities, including the University of Natal and WITS. He earned his master's and doctoral qualifications from the Graduate School of City University of New York. Transformation, democracy, and development are fundamental themes of his research. His latest book, South Africa's Suspended Revolution, Hopes and Prospects, has informed debates around the country's transition to democracy, as well as its prospects for inclusive development. Uh, Adam will be speaking today on reimagining the financing of the South African University. Please join me in welcoming Professor Adam Happy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manuel. That was really lovely. I must say that uh, we have a marketing team at WITS, and clearly they put that uh, uh, piece together. So uh, thank you, Manuel. I do want to say a couple of things. I thought that firstly I should start off with like all others did by thanking Skip and the team at the Hutchinson Center and the Center for African Studies for 
for giving me the opportunity to be here. It's been a wonderful opportunity to sit back and reflect and write uh, and think through. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I thought before I start my paper, I should give some background. Uh, unlike most of you, uh, I've been an institutional bureaucrat for the last couple of years, uh, serving as vice chancellor of the University of Advertisement, uh, which in this case you would see as the president of a university. And I've always kind of seen myself as a, as a vice chancellor or president with a social justice orientation. For many years, I had begun writing uh, around transformation, as Emmanuel suggested, inclusive development, uh, democracy. And I've been arguing and predicting that we're heading for a social explosion in the university system. And the reason I've been arguing that is that as since 1994, we expanded higher education from about 400,000 uh, students to about 1.1 million. But the per capita subsidy for universities began to decline. So as you started expanding, you started spending less per student in the university system. And the way university vice chancellors and executives began to deal with that shouldn't be uh, foreign in, in the US is they began to increase fees. And so over 15 years of double digit fee increases, what you effectively had is a situation where uh, you priced out higher education outside the hands of not only the working classes, but also the middle classes. And so this I've been writing about for many years. I haven't been the only one. Many vice chancellors have been writing about this for a long period of time. My luck is, of course, is that I come, become vice chancellor, and a year and a half later, South Africa experiences precisely the largest student protests since 1994. So something I've been predicting comes to fruition just about the time I became vice chancellor. And so effectively, that's what effectively uh, took place. That's the university I'm at. It's the University of Advances in the middle of Johannesburg. And perhaps I should just say one other thing. It's an interesting institution. It's the place that probably produces one of the highest uh, research output on the African continent. It's got an illustrious political pedigree. Everybody from Nelson Mandela to Robert Sabukwe uh, studied at the place. Uh, almost all of uh, the political leadership from within the ruling party, from within the opposition, uh, all study at this place at one time or the other. It produces something like 70% of the country's CEOs. And it's probably, with the University of Cape Town, the most well-known uh, around the world. Uh, but when I describe this institution to American audiences, I often say, imagine it as a mix between Berkeley and Harvard. It's got the political orientation of a Berkeley. It's got the reputation of the 1960s and what happened in, in Berkeley. But at the same time, it's got the academic illustriousness of a Harvard or a Stanford. It's that combination that makes it a very potent institutional uh, institution in the society. It captures the imagination in a way that no other institution does. So anyway, in October 2015, as we increase the fees as part of this, uh, this dilemma, uh, double digits, 10% increase in fees in a context where inflation is about 6%. Government subsidy is about 3%. So you make up for the government subsidy by increasing the fees. And effectively, we have a student protest. It launched on Wednesday, about October 15, 16, 2015. By the following week, Monday, it exploded across the country. All 26 universities we're out on the streets in, in this thing. And so that's, if you like, the protest. That's the protest at Ritz. And effectively, it brought out tens of thousands of students onto the streets. Uh, that's the march on the national parliament uh, four days later. Uh, and you'll see that it's quite a diverse march. 
uh, it's, it's, uh, and it became quite quickly a national social movement. Our first engagement, our first response to this protest was effectively an engagement with the student leadership. Uh, and you will see that in 2015, we began to engage the students, we began to look at it. Publicly, I had issued a statement, as did many vice chancellors, that we actually agree with the student demands, that effectively student fees had become too expensive. And that you can't think about having a public education system where the vast, the largest proportion of funding comes from actually private fees. And so there's a real legitimacy to the critique. And so we engaged this, uh, this protest. Uh, you'll see in the next slide, this was an overnight stay. I started at 8 o'clock. The next morning we ended was 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm really tired at that point. Uh, and effectively, the central message we took with the student leadership is that actually, while we sympathize, we're not making the concession. The state has to make the concession. Because actually, if we get rid of the fees, then we're going to start impacting on the academic program. So we, supportive of the protest, provided the government makes up the fees that students would have paid. And a week later, effectively, uh, President Zuma, in an engagement, uh, decided to say he'll agree to, to pay from the state the zero percent, so students will get zero percent, there won't be an increase, and the two billion that would have paid gone to the universities for the increased fees would come from state coffers. It was the first significant increase in the subsidy in over 15 years. So that's 2015. In 2016, the protests fundamentally changed. They became factionalized, they became violent in many ways, and effectively, uh, student leaders, or at least factions of student leaders, took the position that said, if there is no free education, there shall be no education at all. We will shut down the system permanently. And in that context, we couldn't allow that to happen. And uh, we began to engage, and through a series of firstly political engagements with the student leadership, and when that didn't succeed, we brought in effectively the police. On the lower bottom here, this photograph here is art at the University of Cape Town being burnt, where effectively student leaders walked into the residences, took all of the art, and said, we're burning the art, because art is a reflection of the old society. In the process, by the way, they burned some of the art of some of the noted anti-apartheid activists including some of the most senior black artists in the country. Uh, effectively, yeah, there was a fight back, if you like, from some students saying we can't allow for a permanent shutdown. You see a bus burning at the University of Cape Town, and here's a student throwing, effectively, stones at the Great Hall at Wits University. And effectively, to save the academic year in 2016, Effectively, we brought in the police. It was the first time uh, somebody said to me as I, I brought in the police, no vice chancellor has ever survived bringing police uh, at Wits University. Uh, but there was no way we could have saved the academic program. And so effectively, we brought the police in, in 2016. And when 2016 happened, in 2017, we finished the academic year, largely with police presence. And in 2017, we had no other student protests. Um, although there were protests in other parts of the country. So UCT ended the year in 2017 with armed patrols, with dogs, around the examination venues to allow people to finish the exams. Uh, in the last two years, we've had two and a half billion worth of infrastructure burnt. Luckily, it with no buildings, but in many other institutions, quite a bit. Uh, and that's been the, if you like, the nature of the, 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 the protest. So in this story, in about 2015 or 2016, I got a call from one of the big publishing houses in South Africa. And they said, would you write the story of Fees Must Fall? 
And I said, I can't write the story of Fees Must Fall because I'm an actor in the process. I do not and cannot write the story in an impartial way. And they said, no, we accept that. But what we want to do is we want you to write a biography of what happened. Because you have an angle on the events that nobody else does. You have an angle because you're engaging the state. You have an angle because you're engaging the student movements. You have an angle because you're engaging uh, big business. You have an angle because you were part of the inner workings of the system. And we want you to also reflect on the dilemma of a progressive activist who's put in the leadership of an institution and how do you grapple with the challenges of uh, institutional constraints? And would you write the story as a, a personal uh, reflection? And so initially we agreed. I'd get, uh, I, I didn't have the time. We'd get a journalist who would assist me to do so. But the journalist soon found out that she wasn't thrilled about the idea of me trying to dictate how she writes. Uh, I was supposed to be the subject rather than uh, the author. And she, I carried on inter interfering with her job. And she said, no, this is not going to work. And towards the end of my first term, uh, the opportunity emerged for me to take five or six months off. And the idea was, I had to skip and I said, can I get this opportunity? Come and sit here and write this story. And effectively, there's, the story is being written, but they are, I'm going to end this book with two essays. The first is the essay on how do you refinance the university? What would you do if you were in charge of the system? And, this, and that's what I'm going to speak on today. And then the second is a second essay, which I'm going to speak on, I think, in a month's time at the Center for African Studies, on how do you advance social justice in a world that is not of your own making? Because I think that too often, the debate on social justice and the tactics and strategies of social justice are effectively reading and applying formulas from the 1960s and the 1970s. That actually, we haven't confronted how do we grapple with constraints, with power, with the new context within which we're located. And so with a reflection of, if you like, uh, this debate, uh, this fees must fall, I want to reflect on what that says about advancing social justice in this world. So two essays, the first of which I'm going to speak on today, and the second of which I'm going to speak in a couple of weeks' time. So here's the story. It seems to me that if we're looking at financing of universities, there are two questions we have to ask. The first is, is it legitimate to have free education in South Africa? And the second, is it affordable? And it seems to me that we should start off firstly with what we mean by free education. And I think that there's an enormous amount of confusion in it. When people speak about free education in Germany, they're speaking about free education that is tuition free. There is no uh, support for, for accommodation or for subsistence. If you're looking at Mexico, free tuition, but no support for uh, residences or accommodation or subsistence. Similarly, perhaps even in Argentina. But if you're looking at places like Scandinavia, what you're looking at is comprehensive tuition, accommodation, and subsistence free. And it seems to me that that's what we're talking about in South Africa. I think if you speak to all sides of this debate, the point is they make tuition, giving free tuition is not the issue. Actually, you have to look at accommodation and subsistence because people, the society has such high levels of inequality that simply freeing up tuition is not going to make a difference because people do not have the accommodation and subsistence to enable them to perform. So what you're talking about is a comprehensive free education that includes accommodation. Now, if you speak to the student leaders about why universities are important, they'll tell you universities are important to address inequality. That if you're going to use this, these institutions need to provide access to poor stu students from poor and marginalized communities. If they continue to simply register students from the rich top 10% in society, you simply reconsolidate the very nature of inequality in the society. But if you can figure out a way 
to allow access to the best universities, of the poorest in the society, then you allow for the class mobility that enables the addressing of inequality in the society. And so the argument for free education is premised on that fundamental assumption. Now, is free education important? In, in one sense, there are, the students would argue yes, that it's important for those particular reasons. It's, however, also is opposed by a number of people. Nicol Kluti, for instance, is a theorist on higher education in South Africa, and he argues that actually it's financially impossible and it's morally wrong. And he argues that it's morally wrong, as do one or two vice chancellors, Max Price, Cesar Mabizela. And the argument is they committed to social justice. But the argument is that if you give free education, you allow rich people not to pay. And in the South African university system, at places like Witsit UCT, we, owe, we charge rich people far more so that we are able to cross-subsidize poor people. By taking away that possibility, you allow rich people to get away from the system. Now, my argument with Max, Cesar, and Nico is that I think that theoretically it doesn't hold. That the problem with what, they, with what they're holding is they assume that free education means nobody pays. There's always somebody pays. It's the tax system that pays. And if you accompany it with the rich paying more in taxes, then you're simply getting the resources back, but in a different mechanism. And what is also interesting is rich people, are they're not simply paying while their children are in university. They're paying in perpetuity through the tax system, which allows them to fund the system. But to be honest, uh, that's the argument that is happening. And if you ask me, I would broadly support the students in this regard. I think we've got to figure out a way on how we enable access into the university. The second question is, is it affordable? And it seems to me that if you ask a uh, number of the student leaders, the argument is yes, it's affordable, simply tax the top 10% in society and you'll pay for it. But very few of them have actually investigated what that means. By how much? How would you get the political will? How do you deal with the economic backlash? How do you deal with all of the challenges that happen when you actually simply act against the rich in any society? Don't assume that the rich are just going to simply accept it. There's always a counteraction. How do you mitigate those, those possibilities? None of that is really discussed by the student leadership. There's a subsequent proposal that emerges, and I'll discuss that in a short while. The ANC re suggested that actually, while they're partial to the notion of universities having been used as instruments to address inequality, what they proposes not free education for everybody, but free education for the poor and the working class. That was the argument. And that's the proposal that they put forward. One of the challenges, one would argue, however, is, and by the way, they argue that because the Constitution says that while primary and secondary education must be free, tertiary education must become free as far as possible and as far as resources allow. So what it calls for is a progressive freeing up of tertiary education. And the argument against the ANC, of course, is if this is what you believed, why is it that subsidies were declining for the last 20 years? That shouldn't have been happening. You should have been addressing that particular challenge. And so it seems to me that that's the question of affordability. So the dilemma of higher education is this. If you're going to free higher education completely, effectively the whole, the, every single student, then what you're looking at is an additional expenditure of 143 billion rand, effectively $12 billion. And it would be impossible without crowding out other expenditure. But at the moment, higher education services the rich. It services largely the top 10% of society. And if you're going to address inequalities, then that leaving the system as it is doesn't work. And so we've got to rethink how to do that. There is a need to provide access to the children of the poor and the marginalized. And effectively, there are about three major proposals 
that have emerged as the protests emerge to begin to challenge and suggest how this could be done. And I'm going to focus on that in a very, very short while. One quick thing that I should do before getting to the nub of the proposals is it seems to me that there are three prerequisites that need to happen before you fix the problem of financing. The first and the most obvious is you need primary and secondary education system to work. If that doesn't work, the pipeline into higher education is completely compromised. In South Africa, 50% of students do not complete grade 12. That means they start, but they don't finish the 12 years. Uh, only 28% of students coming out of secondary education ha uh, get a bachelorette pass that would allow them to enter into the university system. That means they meet the minimum requirements coming in. As long as you don't fix this problem, you're in serious trouble. Your second uh, issue that you need to do is invert the pyramid. At the moment, the largest number of students enter into universities. They comprise the largest component of the post-secondary education system. But that doesn't work in developing world societies. In effect, what you need is a much stronger tivot college, uh, tiveted college sector. A sector that, until now, has not grown. It's got poor quality. We need to close them down. We need to address them. We need to build new ones. And we need to integrate them with corporates, with the private sector, as exists in the German case. Because that creates the kinds of vocation and technical skills that will allow you to address a 30% unemployment rate in the country. Uh, the third is, seems to be you need a diverse university system. If you look at the United States, only five, you've got about 5,000 universities. Only 5% are allowed to, uh, to graduate PhDs. In a sense, what we've got to do is have a diverse system that has some institutions that are focusing on uh, uh, teaching-oriented institutions, liberal art colleges, if you like, some focused on research-intensive institutions, masters and PhDs, and a whole series that have a mix uh, of, of the two components. Diverse systems are what allow society to achieve and respond, this higher education system, to respond to the multiple needs of an economy and of a society. And so those are the three systems, prerequisites, it seems to me, that we need to. But once you've got that, then you can start looking, it seems to me, at the financing question. And the first model I want to look at is something called Tutu Kele Sedi. Basically, it's a model that was produced by the student leadership. And it was a proposal that largely emerged from uh, basically an ex SRC president, Shafi Varachia, had approached a young academic in the accounting department at WITS, uh, a guy called Kaya Sitole. And Kaya Sitole brought a number of honor students around him. And basically, they weren't very political. But the mandate they had was figure out a way, create a financial model that the student leadership can articulate that will allow for and enable free education in South Africa. And effectively, my first interaction with this model was I was sitting in, a, in an engagement called by the minister. And I was representing the vice chancellors and sitting on the podium with the minister and the president. And the students were threatening to disrupt the event. Uh, and effectively, I get a call while I'm on the podium, before the meeting, this thing starts, from Shafi saying, will you endorse this proposal that we've just developed? Uh, if you do, we can convince the students to go back. And I responded by saying, I refuse to endorse a proposal I've not read. I am not doing it. And he says, well, I'll send it to you now, and you can read it while you're sitting there. And I said, no, that's not the way we're going to do it. Uh, but subsequently, I did read the proposal that they had sent. And the proposal was very thoughtful. It was perhaps one of the most sophisticated that emerged. But its big challenge was it was proposing tax increases around 10% on the corporate sector that would have imploded the economy. So subsequently, I engaged Kaya Sitole. And Kaya then said to me that actually, we've revised this proposal, and we've got a new proposal on which they sent to me, which I think was, at that time, one of the most sophisticated that developed. And basically, it proposed three major 
uh, uh, revisions. The first is it argued for state subsidy to go back from 38% to what it was now to 50% uh, uh, what it was in 2000 uh, in the country. So basically increase the state subsidy from about 38 to 50% over the next period of time. The second is it argued for capital, inf for basically infrastructure fund, funded by the private sector that is incentivized by capital allowances and tax rebates. And what they must do is largely invest in the university system around research, around historically black universities, around accommodation, etc. And the third he argued for was something called an educational endowment fund. The educational endowment fund was initially to be capitalized by skills levy, a 1% levy that currently exists on, all, on, the way, on the payroll for all companies in the country. But what he says is capitalize it with the skills levy, but then maintain it through the graduate tax so that every student who graduates in the country, 1.6 million of them, will pay a special tax. And that tax will then go into this fund and it will fund this, the fees and the subsistence and the accommodation of current students. So every generation of students gets funded by preceding generations of students in the system. Uh, the critique, there was a number of critiques around this model. The first and the most obvious was from a guy called George Hull uh, from the University of Cape Town. And basically what George suggested was the graduate tax is unfair. Uh, basically, he says it may cost you, I don't know, six, seven hundred thousand uh, to spend uh, eight hundred thousand maybe uh, to, to, to do an undergraduate degree. But if you have a graduate tax, people are paying in perpetuity. So you land up paying far in excess to what your actual cost of study uh, is. And so he said this is really unfair. I, my problem with this is this is a narrow definition of, of fairness. Because it seems to me that there are many measures in society. There are many instruments in society where older generations effectively pay for, for younger generations. Parents pay for, for, for their children in schooling, in higher education in many parts of the world. And so in a sense, what you're doing is you're simply collectivizing that responsibility. And collectivizing that responsibility is largely captured in the notion of Ubuntu, uh, this notion that of solidarity that I am because of you are. And in a society as unequal as South Africa, in a society that is as racially charged as South Africa, in a society where so much of your benefits are really a product of a racialized history, a sense of solidarity may, must be integrally uh, encapsulated in the notion of fairness. And it seems to me that George Hull doesn't do that. So I don't think it's a, a really adequate critique. I think that there's two more substantive critiques, if you like. The first is, I'm not so sure the proposal carries the support of the students themselves, even though it came out of the student movement. Because there are significant numbers of students that I've spoken to who, who worry about what they, what they describe as a black tax. Why should they be subjected to a tax? when generations before them were not. And what there is, is a number of student leaders, including the earlier one that I discussed, who actually came out explicitly out against uh, uh, this idea of a graduate tax. And so I'm not so sure a proposal that is meant to be in the interest of students isn't carrying sufficient numbers of students with it. And I worry about that. The second problem is that the arithmetic doesn't add up. So if you look at the numbers, uh, the Treasury did a study of the graduate tax on 1.6 million people who are in the society, anybody earning an income of above 75,000, they did a 1% tax and that comes to 2 million, 2.2 billion. If you had a 2% tax, you're looking at five, just under 5 billion. 5 billion is effectively comprehensive cost, I said to you, will be $12 billion, $143 billion. The graduate tax is less than 3% of that full cost. The arithmetic just doesn't add up around the graduate tax. And it seems to me that that's effectively the big problem. 
The second model is something called Ikusasa. Ikusasa really is launched by a guy called Sizwe Kasada. And uh, Sizwe is essentially the chair of this FAS, which is the uh, scholarship agency. But he's also the previous chair of one of the largest banks in South Africa, the First National Bank. And really, again, this emerged in quite an interesting way. In early 2015, before the protests began, we introduced a debate amongst the vice chancellors that we're heading for a crisis. We knew we were heading for a crisis because the issues of fees were constantly emerging. And so we put the issue of should we start approaching the banks to say, can you put a scholarship, can you lend, give us some money for high income categories, engineers, doctors, accountants, etc., people who earn a lot of money. Because if they, if you can get them in, and if you can fund them now, you can get them to fund their BMWs and their big car houses and cars down the line. And that would save us money in which we could redirect to students that are not getting funded in the system. In the conversation, one of the bank CEOs, uh, a guy called Sim Shabalala, the head of Standard Bank, said to me, one of the ways that you need to think through is ask government to use its scholarship, the money it puts into scholarship, as simply a guarantee. And let the banks raise that money on the open market. And they will raise 10 times that amount and they could fund this entire system through an income loan contingent scheme. And effectively, that idea came out, born. We discussed it with Doet. Doet opposed it. Most vice chancellors opposed it. And the idea had uh, immediately died. Six months later, the protests happened. Once the protests happen, the idea resurfaces and says, this is perhaps something that we should think about. And they, by that time, Sisu had left FNB and become the chair of the largest scholarship agency, and he was mandated to effectively create a system. And so what he created was effectively a public-private partnership, where you have a mix of loans and bursaries for students on the basis of a family income up to 600,000. So if you have a family income of less than 600,000, you could get fully funded for comprehensively institution, accommodation, and subsistence. What the private sector would make the money available, and the reason they would make the money available is because of tax concessions and procurement benefits. In South Africa, you have something called black economic empowerment. You have to empower the black community, otherwise you don't qualify for procurement possibilities in the state. If you revise that legislation and said you could qualify for that procurement if you actually invested in the system. And so in a sense, what he was looking for was an income contingent loan. Students will get the money from the banks. They will only pay at a certain income. Once they start working and they earn a certain income, then they start paying back. Uh, it's called an income con contingent loan threshold. And effectively, that was the model that he put forward. The third model that emerged was effectively something called the Hare Commission. After the 2015 protests, the Hare Commission uh, effectively uh, was established. It was a presidential commission. Uh, and basically, it had a series of engagements around the country. It spoke to everybody, students, vice chancellors, uh, big business. Everybody spoke at it. And after a year and a half, it was very delayed. It came out with a proposal in end of August 2017. And basically, it made a couple of uh, uh, suggestions. One was invert the pyramid, build the tivot sector. You're not going to fix South Africa's unemployment problem without building vocational skills. And building vocational skills as required in the college sector, not in the university sector. Build that, make it free. And what it argued for was effectively uh, finding some money in the unemployment insurance fund that hadn't used it, utilized its resources, and argued for a 50 billion investment into the tivot sector, uh, and the fees must be free. The second thing it suggested for the universities is a subsidy increase from 0.7% of GDP to 1% of GDP, what was effectively what Kaya Sitole was arguing effectively start increasing the subsidy because that's where the fees problem starts. As the, the subsidies fell, fees increased, 
increase the subsidies, and then you contain the fee increase. The second is university infrastructure, particularly historically black universities, and student accommodation. There's a massive shortage. There's 200,000 shortage of 200,000 beds at universities for students. And effectively, what it argued was get the private sector to do this. Give them tax concessions, allow them to, to, this, uh, to invest in the, uh, based on tax concessions into the infrastructure, and that would address it. And then what it argued was what Cizu and Kasada did. The income contingent loans, banks will provide the loans, but effectively, they will be guaranteed by the state. And that's the proposal that the Hare Commission put forward. Now, the problem with this is there's some positives with it. Firstly, increasing the per capita subsidy makes sense. It's logical. That was where the causal feature for the increase in fees, you need to address that. Second, getting the private sector involved also makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's the one way you could get them involved. You need to, to regulate this in a much more uh, tighter way. Clearly, this is a resource-scarce environment. The biggest criticism came in from the income contingent loans. And it really came in because if you look at the case studies around the world, Income contingent loans have either aggravated inequality or and or created a huge debt burden. And there is two big cases of this. The one is the UK, and the second is the United States. Student debt in the United States sits at $1.3 trillion. Student debt in the, the UK has become astronomical, and the income contingent loans scheme was introduced in the 19... Uh, in the 1990s under the Blair government. But when the Blair government introduced it, the guy who introduced it now calls the income contingent loan scheme a Ponzi scheme. He actually says it's unpayable. There's no way this can be paid. And it creates deep resentment in the society. It accelerates inequality and aggravates it. And frankly, it creates deep unhappiness and politically polarizes society. And if that happened in the UK and the US, you can be guaranteed that in the South African context, given our history, that's going to be the likely outcomes. And so the real dilemma is what do you do? You know that it's not the best day, but yet you don't have the sufficient resources to grapple with 140 billion. That's effectively the challenge that we confront. As this debate was playing itself out, they released it in August. The debate comes out, the document comes out formally in November, but it leaks somewhere in October. There's a huge debate in the society. And as this is happening, uh, a new development happens in November 2017, just a couple of months ago. Effectively, a new actor emerges. A guy called Morris Masuta, also a, a, a SRC president at Wits University of a couple of years ago. Morris has two things that is interesting about him. One, is a, he's got a good political pedigree, he was the SRC president, but he was also dating the president's daughter. Uh, and as he was dating the president's daughter, he got to know the president really well. And as he got to know the president, he became quite influential in influencing the thoughts of the president. Now, if I said this two years ago in the United States, this would have been difficult to sell. Having saying and saying it now in 2018, I think most people can identify with how these things happen. So effectively, what he does is he was doing a PhD at the University of Bath in the UK. And his proposal, his thesis is that actually the way you finance universities in the South African context is by actually giving free education, comprehensive education, for everybody with a family income of 350,000 per less, uh, per annum. Less, less than $350,000. And the argument was very simple. He argued correctly, I think, that the original number, which was 122000 hadn't been adjusted for 15 years for inflation. And it's just unacceptable. But the second, is he argued, is 350000 per annum below covers 90% of families in the South African society. So 90% of South African society earns less than 350,000 per annum. And so what he, he, he argued for was give everybody a free education for that amount. It was heavily opposed by Treasury and Doet, 
uh, Department of Higher Education and Training on simply the grounds of affordability. That offer would have cost 57 billion uh, when, it's, when it's implemented. And so effectively, uh, uh, that's something that's worth bearing in mind. Secondly, it's worth bearing in mind while it comprises 90% of the population have a family income of less than 350, only 40% of the students in the system. They're not equally represented in the university system. Only 40% of students in the university system would be covered. And so 60% of universities in the system are above the three, the 300 and, uh, sorry, the 350,000 uh, per annum. It excludes the vast majority of students at Witson UCT. The vast majority of students at UCT are what we call missing middle students. They're too rich for the scholarship system, but too poor to afford the cost of higher education. And that was the challenge that it seems to me that exists uh, in there. So where the protest really took place, ground zero of the protest, was at Witson UCT. And yet it doesn't address their particular challenge, although it's defendable on moral grounds because it impacts on the poorest of the poor in the society. So what happens? There's a big argument about this. Uh, initially, it looks like the president's going to make an announcement. The treasury and department officials get to uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, the incumbent, uh, the person coming into the system. Uh, there's an election happening, and effectively, uh, they get to him, and the ANC stops the president. The ANC leadership stops the president from doing anything. That happens, and we start going into December. On the evening of December, in a very close fought election, the ANC conference is taking place, they're choosing the president, and the president by default will become the president of the country. And it's a close race between Nkosazan and Lamini Zuma, President Zuma's ex-wife, and Cyril Ramaphosa. And on the evening of the conference, in a cynical attempt, the president says, I don't see why I can't make this announcement. I am the president after all. And so he announces, by presidential proclamation, free education for all those with a family income of less than 350,000. He effectively implements the Morris Masuta proposal. And he says, sue me. I'm doing it. Of course, he was trying to shift the elections in the, in, in the ANC. It doesn't succeed. And the Ramaphosa team actually wins. But what is interesting is they're in no position to actually back off. They can't, once the concession has been made, it would be politically suicidal for them to pull back on the concession. And so they live with the concession. And they say, well, we'll have to just figure out a way to pay for it. And so effectively, you get by default a situation where essentially the president by proclamation, effective from 2018, all those with a family income of less than 350,000, he did say it will be uh, sent over five years. It will be initiated over a period of five years. So first year is every year in the system. So, is the Zuma concession affordable? It seems to me the cost of full implementation, it's just, remember, it's not the whole, it's just those with a family income of less than 350,000. I said to you that's 40% of students in the system. It will cost you 57 billion. 23 billion has already been raised by an increase in VAT in the February 2018 budget. Effectively, there's a big debate about whether that's fair because VAT is regressive and the poor end up paying a much higher component than the rich, if you like, and that effectively you're getting free education being paid by the poor through the tax system. Some people don't know what VAT is. VAT is a value-added tax, which means effectively anything you go and purchase in, uh, in the shop would have an additional tax debt. So if it costs uh, $100, it will be 15% on $100 and add additional 15. So it, you'll pay 115, although 15 of that goes to the state and the 100 goes to, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to, the, to the enterprise itself. Uh, 
I also think, so 23, 57 billion is what it costs, 23 billion already raised. Last year's growth rate was at 1%. This year's is anticipated to be at 2.5%. If you reach to 2.5%, you'll have more than enough resources to pay for the 57 billion. So to argue that it's not affordable is just factually wrong. The question is, you could ask, is the money being spent wisely? Should it be spent on higher education rather than early childhood development? Should it be spent on higher education rather than primary or secondary? Or should it be spent on, 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 on higher education rather than health? That's a legitimate question. But it's worth saying that this decision was made by a democratic government, whether you like it or not. And in a sense, a democratic government has a right to effectively make spending priorities around the public press. And so, in a sense, I think the issue is affordable. It's not fair to argue that it's not affordable, uh, not affordable as many have suggested. The new financing of universities, where I'm coming to the end, effectively, this is where we stand at the moment, in 2018. The protest started in 2015. Students with a family income of less than 350,000, they're given a grant for tutorial, accommodation, and subsistence. Effectively, they have free education. Missing middle students, those above 350,000, will be confronted with effectively an income contingent loan system. That is what Hale Commission was about. And effectively, if they don't qualify for under 350, the income contingent loan scheme will happen through effectively the Ikusasa model. And so they will find their monies through there. And then students of means will pay. Uh, and this will be contained because in addition to that, the Hale Commission initiated what is a fee cap regime that the system will be, will establish a system where effectively fees will be determined at a national level. So individual institutions cannot simply increase fees the way they want to. And so there'll be a fee cap regime largely along the lines of the United Kingdom or many places in, in Western Europe. Um, um, so basically what you'll have is a fee system, a fully fledged fee system but a fee system and a subsidy system mix, but effectively a fee system that will be fundamentally different to the one before the 2015 protest. And so I would argue for an additional reform. The current financial system must not ossify. Because whether we like it or not, it still doesn't address the fundamental critique that income contingent loans aggravate inequality. The dilemma you have is you just don't have the money to fund it. But for now, they, you run the risk that they will continue to create the unhappiness within the society. So what you need is the mix between fees and state funding must be regularly reviewed and shifted in favor of the former, shifted in favor of the subsidy. And what I would argue is tie the university subsidy to economic growth rates. So if you're at 2.5%, your proportion of subsidy must be this amount. If you grow to 3%, your proportion of subsidy increases by that amount. If you go to 4%, you increase by another. And so what you've done, then created is what I call an evolving agenda of structural reforms, a systemic creep in favor of comprehensive free education. It will enable us, if you like, to address the disparities of our past, which is important. But more importantly, or as importantly, it will allow us to create the possibilities of a socially inclusive future. It seems to me that what we need to understand is the lessons to move towards that socially inclusive future. And that's the subject of a future talk. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Thank you. that's fascinating. Um, so, what is the state of student unrest now? I mean, is everyone happy with this proposal? So, uh, so a, a couple of things. One is, uh, it depends what you mean by that. So, firstly, what you have is, in a lot of ways, this has come by default rather than by design. It's just happened in January 2018. Effectively, the first part of that system has come in, and the first part of that system is the 
350 and below. The second part of the system, which is the ICL, uh, the income contingent loan system hasn't been activated on scale yet. And it seems to me that there hasn't been a discussion around that, and it hasn't got to scale. So for now, you've got some students below that qualify, and they're in, and they're happy. The ones above the 350 don't yet have an income contingent loan scheme uh, on scale. There's, I think, 2,500 students or something, but there isn't available on scale. And here's the dilemma. The income contingent loan scheme will service the vast majority of the students. And so in a sense, uh, there hasn't been, if you like, uh, uh, we, haven't, we haven't fully activated the, the, the new system yet. I will say one other thing. We've not had any protests as WITS for 2017 and 2018. But there has been protests in other parts of the system. Uh, so for instance, in Walter Sisulu, there has been huge protests. Uh, there's been protests at uh, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology around not fees, but around the administration of the loan scheme that is not being done efficiently. So it seems to me that the, we haven't reached full acceptance yet. Uh, there's still a large number of students who are opposed to the idea of the income contingent loan. But to be honest, at the moment, I don't believe there's the resources for that to be addressed. And I think that they begrudgingly will come to have to accept that over the next period of time. The only thing I would argue is that's why you need an additional reform, that the system doesn't ossify, that it doesn't get stuck there, that you need, if you like, a creeping, a creeping, a creeping increase in the subsidy as we go forward. Thank you, Adam. It was a very interesting presentation, and it echoes the situation, I think, in a number of countries nowadays. Um, in Mauritius, we've been discussing that for quite a moment now. Um, in fact, there's the Nobel Prize for Economy, Joseph Stiglitz, who wrote an article last year in The Economist uh, saying that the United States should emulate Mauritius because we have free education and free health care. Uh, but there's a big debate going on about um, how do you establish um, a threshold and a kind of a means test. And mostly it's, uh, left parties were opposed to it because they say that it wouldn't be fair to be putting on a, a means test and you don't know, you never know how it's used afterwards. So I wanted to have your view uh, about that, about establishing a threshold and how do you um, put this kind of means test, and do you think it's fair? Uh, so again, I think that the threshold is really an interesting argument. If you speak to, to some of the, the student protesters, they were arguing that effectively you shouldn't have any threshold, that the system must be universal free education, and that the way you fund that is through the tax system. Now, in an ideal case, it seems to me that that's what would be the best way to go forward. The problem is we don't live in an ideal world. And the problem is you just don't have the resources to go to scale on this yet. So what you're looking for is, what I'm arguing for, is a slow creep in favor. A series of, over a period of 10, 15, 20 years, a proportional increase in the subsidy that slowly eats into the ICL the loan scheme. That's what you, you effectively argue. So initially you start at 350, future you go to, the more resources can become available, you increase to 450, 500, 600, 700, slowly feeding through the system. And as you do that, you increase the fees, uh, the, the tax regime that enables that. That's the best way, it seems to me, to think it through. The problem is this, that in the meantime, you do need the threshold, because how do you determine at every point, how you qualify. And is there a danger in, in doing that? And there's two problems with thresholds. One is the abuse by state officials to, who use thresholds in particular ways. The second is the administrative cost. There's an enormous administrative cost for the bureaucracy to administer this thing. And that's the two, two contexts. 
But here's the dilemma, it seems to me. And it seems to me that this is what we've got to think through, and it's something that I will reflect on in the, in the next paper. And that is, how do you advance social justice? Too often activists tend to advance social justice by making the demand. And they assume that the demand can be realized because they assume the world exists in the way they wished it existed. But the world doesn't. And so you do have countervailing voices and countervailing power. And so it seems to me that what you want to start thinking through in social justice is how to start thinking through creating a series of structural reforms that have a snowballing logic that slowly begin to move towards the outcome you want. If you like, it's the perennial question of how do you advance social justice. And if you look at Gramsci, the Italian communist who died in, what is it, the late 20s, 30s, effectively that's the story. It's a Gramscian strategy of creating a snowballing logic that slowly begins to create a creeping, you know, people talk about how neoliberalism emerged in a creeping way. Well, what you want to do is effectively do the counter in a creeping way. Slowly, uh, progressively begin to create a snowballing logic. And it seems to me that that's the real debate uh, around it. So for me, there's two parts to this debate. The first is Stiglitz is making the argument as simply a policy measure. The point about it is, how do you bring in effect a policy measure is a political question. And it seems to me that then we need a more Gramscian strategy as opposed to a belief that this all happens all at one shot. And that's where I think the real debate needs to start, start emerging in this context. Thank you so much for that, um, that talk. It's, um, it very much uh, resonates with a lot that I've been involved in in the um, University of California system, which was defunded quite radically following the, um, the 2008 market crash. And um, part of, and you know, California is a progressive state well, compared to many of the states um, in the United States, but part of what we've seen here and in the UK as well is that neoliberal ideology take over uh, publicly funded universities. And uh, part, and for instance, the graduate uh, tax that you mentioned is, does belong to that ideology because uh, behind it is that education is not a public good but an individual benefit. And therefore, the in individuals who benefit from it and receive a higher earning power should pay back. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Chris Newfield's work. Um, I know he's visited a bunch of times, but uh, he's calculated, like in California, for instance, uh, it's an average of $35 per person increased state tax that would provide at least tuition-free education at all of the campuses. So um, the question I had, you know, in terms of the South African case, because um, as you said, there were there seems to be um, at least. A, um, um, an ideological and a political kind of component to the financing of universities. And I wanted to ask you to what degree did, um, as much as it might be unrealistic, the student protests uh, clearly forced the hands of the politicians. Uh, but also the kind of um, that ideology, I mean there seems to be a given that education to a certain degree is a public good that we've lost that war here in the United States. And so I'd like you to speak a little bit to that in terms of the history of South Africa, but also um, the maybe the even if realistic about a kind of uh, utopian vision of the students that give up a, uh, a kind of public, that gets it into the public discourse yeah. is, is the question. So I think that there's three different uh, elements of what, you, what you're suggesting. Uh, and I think that all three of us are important. So let's start with the, with the student protest. Was the student protest valuable? And the book is actually quite clear on this, and I've been publicly quite clear. None of this would have happened without the student protest. What the student protested is it changed 
the systemic parameters of what was possible. And yes, they have a particular vision of what that, what that should be. But none of uh, the movement, the debate, the possibilities would have emerged without any protest here. In a sense, this debate has been going on for 10 years by vice chancellors. The students did in 10 days what vice chancellors had been debating for 10 years at this time. And that does bring to the fore the importance of social struggle, the importance of mobilization, the importance of how mass activity can open up systemic possibilities that wouldn't have existed before. And so I'm quite clear on that. The question that I'm posing is, is that absolute? Is that the only part of the story? Or is there more to understand in the story of how do you achieve social justice? And I'm suggesting that that, if you like, is the foundation, but on the foundation needs to be established a whole series of other understandings if you're going to get the kinds of social justice outcomes that we need. So that's the first point um, I would make. The second is even in South Africa, there's a debate. So George Hull, who I, I discussed earlier on, makes the point, as does Nico Clutti, that higher education is a private and a, a public good. It's a public good because it allows and creates for the skill sets required for society to progress. But the returns on investment in terms of income, in terms of this thing, is quite significant. In fact, South Africa has one of the highest rates in the world in proportional terms. And that means that it's a huge private good. And therefore, the argument is that it should, there should be a, a, a payment for the thing. In the book, I argue against it, saying that actually lots of things have both public and private goods. Private, uh, primary and secondary education does as well. But yet we fund it through the public purse because of the collective benefit. And it seems to me that the same approach should be adopted with regards to, 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 at least, you know, uh, to at least higher education as well. So the question is, for me, I'm, I'm quite supportive and sympathetic to the view that it should be treated as a public good. The question then becomes, is the affordability of it? Uh, is it possible? And how do you create the process where we begin to move towards that outcome? And the point about the University of California system, is again, it didn't happen in one single blow. The University of California, the state subsidy decline in the University of California system didn't happen simply after 2008. It had begun, it's been in so systemic decline, if you like, over the last 15, 20 years. And it seems to me that that's the challenge that we have had around the world. And it's the challenge of South Africa. Ironically, the university system was premised on uh, a public good under apartheid because it serviced white students. And so it effectively was fully paid for by the state. It is only when it became democratic, only under the democratic era, that effectively it begins to become, for want of another word, privatized. And so there's a contradiction in the way this evolved. Now part of the reason is, got to do with the fact that they were expanding the system, that they wanted to ensure that black students had access to the system, and they doubled the system in the space of 15 years. But, and they didn't have the resources, and so they started doing it. But that's the thing that's worth, worth, worth bearing in mind. I'll end at this point, it seems, so the point I'm making is again, instead of imagining a big bang, I'm imagining a systemic creep back to the notion of the higher education being a public good. And that's the way we should imagine it, as opposed to a single act in a single this thing. But should, were the students essential to that? Absolutely. Would never have happened uh, without, without the students' uh, protest that happened in 2015. Okay, thanks, Adam. I, um, really interesting talk. And I just want to have a quick question about retention. Because I, I remember learning a few years back that the rate of retention in South African universities is abysmal. So um, the talk and the protests all seem to focus on barriers to entry, financial barriers to entry, creating a more equal, fair system. But the institutions themselves 
from my understanding, which might be dated, don't really do a good job of retaining black students and graduating black students at the same rate as other students. So you make this free system, or at least free for those who are economically disadvantaged, but you ch if nothing else changes, that doesn't mean they'll graduate. Or, and even for those middle income students, now they might have all these loans, but they didn't graduate. So that's my question. What about retention? other challenges to the institution and the structure that are barriers once students arrive on campus? Absolutely. So at the moment, the numbers are as follows. 55% uh, of students who enter the system do not complete. So basically, you have a graduation uh, rate of about 45% systemic. If you take a place like this at the top end, you would have a graduation rate on time, that means finishing a three-year degree in three years, a four-year degree in four years, uh, of about uh, 35, 40 percent. If you added an additional layer, you jump to 55. If you add uh, two years, you're probably at 70, 72 percent. So at WITS, you probably are better off. At UCT, you probably are better off. But system-wide, 55 percent of students are getting lost. The second that's worth bearing in mind is that this does have racial or, uh, profiles. So 70% of students, white students, would pass. But only 50% of black students would, would graduate out of the system. And so there's clearly a differential. And that's got to do with differential educational endowments, particularly coming out of the primary and secondary education system that is happening, which is why my big fear about this is the state declaring free education and then saying, now do it, and effectively, we basically start landing up cutting services. Because if you start cutting services, you're cutting academic programs, you start cutting academic programs, you have effectively the outcome that aggravates that, that retention rate. And so it's, it seems to me that that's the one challenge around it. The second is I do think that one of the dangers with, with executives and academics is that we too often reflect and say the problem is that the problem in, in South African universities is that the students are not coming through that are of, 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 of sufficient quality. The problem is the primary and secondary education system. Well, that's kind of deflecting the problem. You've got you to address this problem. And it seems to me that one of the interesting things that we need to learn is both in the UK and the US system, is people, talented students come from around the world who don't, who are not conversant in English, and yet are quickly able to go and perform at significant uh, graduation rates, simply because of systems of support that have come into play over a period of time. And so I think that there are lessons to be learned. Why do people, why is there such a, uh, a fallout, why is there such so, so large numbers of students who are not graduating? I would say two things. One is money. So what you do is you get, you get into the university, but you just don't have enough resources at home or enough resources to survive. And, and, and so you're constantly doing other things rather than concentrate on study. The second is language proficiency. It's begun to have a huge impact on the system. And both that has to be addressed. Uh, in quite a significant way. Let me end by one final thing. The problem is a, is a South African system, but it's a global system problem. If you look at the United States and the numbers of students that do not graduate in the United States from its higher education system, it's astonishingly high for a system this large. And, this, and so, and I can tell you, the Europeans have smaller numbers relative to the United States. South Africa is far, far higher than anybody. I think South Africa is worse than uh, probably one of the worst in the continent. And so it's a, it's a real challenge, and I think that globally we need to start thinking through how to, how to address this challenge. Finally, sorry, I, I, this thing, one other thing I, I do think, that there needs to be a much bigger collaboration on institutional culture, on institutional acclimatization. Because I can tell you now that as you're having uh, the fights in, in American universities around Black Lives Matter. 
so too those same fights are taking place. So we call it Roads Must Fall. It was basically around symbols. It's about transformation. And it's about diversity of the professoriate. It's about the culture of the place. It's about our institutions expecting black students to adjust to the institution rather than the institution adjusting to them. Those debates are very, very real in South Africa. In a lot of ways, I think, in a way, South Africa is slightly ahead of the US in grappling with those. Partly because whether we like it or not, it's not a minority, it's the majority. And so it has a, an ascendancy in a way that, that American institutions haven't been able to grapple with this. I saw a, a piece by Drew Forst uh, yesterday about a task team that was sitting around uh, reflecting on, on, on how to create a culture, an institutional culture which people feel part of the community. Those same debates, if you like, are taking place there. And in, I, I recall in 2014, we released a, 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 a plan on how to address those issues. So I think that there's lots of collaboration around those that, that are possible. Sorry. <clears throat> Adam, thank you very much for this. I, I think um, I find the, the analysis of financing the future very compelling indeed. I'd like to ask the three questions about the first half of the paper, your reflection on the, the period of protest. Um, one is this, uh, you focus primarily on the fees dimension of, of the protest, but of course uh, across the country uh, other issues, pedagogic issues, decoloniality, etc., were also involved. How looking back on them now do you reflect on the substantive and the pedagogic dimensions of that moment? That's the first one. The second one is this, um, you've dealt with the protest as a rather monolithic form. But uh, as we all know, the, the movement itself fragmented internally and was also interpolated by the political parties, each in their own nefarious ways. How do you reflect on that and what impact does that have on the broader politics of students and South African political life? And the third, uh, third is, um, and this is an unfair question, <laughs> given the fact that we want to see the book. Um, the Vice Chancellor's sui generis were criticized for the impact of security on campuses and the, quotes, excess violence. And of course, this flooded social media across the planet. And I suspect that if there were a South African student in the room who was there at the time, uh, they would want to vex you on this. How do you reflect back on that and on that critique? So I think all of those are interesting, actually. By the way, they are covered in the book. So, uh, so the decolon, here's, here's how it emerged. Uh, in October 2015, there's a protest that starts at Wits University, largely around fees. And basically it emerges around the fee increase, not free education. Once they win that, then the students, of course, argue for free education. But initially, it's around the fee increase. Uh, so that, and what is interesting, and I, tell, I speak about this in the book, the demand of the SRC, by the way, was not for zero fees. It was for 8%, not 10%. That was the, uh, the demand. Of course, once the protest started, they said, actually, we, we, we don't want any fee increase. <laughs> but, but, but that's how it starts. Six months earlier, there's an earlier protest that happened. And the earlier protest emerges at UCT. And at UCT, it emerges around the statue of uh, Rhodes, who was the benefactor of the land that, that on which UCT was listed. And basically, although it was about the statue, it was about fundamentally the issue of decoloniality. How do you rethink the institution, both in terms of what it teaches, the nature of its professoriate, its cultural expressions, its naming traditions, etc. Now at Wits, we knew this was coming. So in 2014, I had opened up a series of engagements where all kinds of stuff, all kinds of students, and we wrote up a plan that effectively is an eight-point plan on rethinking the university, from renaming buildings to renaming the parks to effectively human, the, the, the debate around uh, staffing conditions for the poorest of workers to the debate around curriculum reform to the debate around uh, issues around uh, fees and how do residences get crisp 
both a cosmopolitan tradition but address the kinds of challenges that how to deal with uh, gender-based harm issues within the residences. So there was a comprehensive plan that effectively we, we, we had developed. Now that doesn't mean this doesn't emerge at WITS, because it does. But in a sense, that wasn't the play that happened at WITS. In the play that really happened at WITS was Fees Must Fall. And then it comes back to these issues. So there's a whole comprehensive plan around that. Here's my debate around decoloniality. The, the, the grapple I have with decoloniality is in the South African context, it's largely constructed in the humanities. That it's not grappling with in the debate that is happening in the sciences and other places. Now I think it can be. Because how you teach, the pedagogy of teaching, is as problematic in physics or in mathematics as it is in, in some of the social sciences of the humanities disciplines. But that hasn't come to the fore in exactly a dramatic way. So that's the first uh, issue, it seems to me, that we need to face. The second is that actually I worry that the debate is at too le high level and abstraction. So often one of the things that I, we've done since the protests have happened is every quarter on those eight points we release an issue that says, here's what has happened, here are the following names that have happened, here are the following new courses that have been introduced, here's the following workshops that have happened in architecture, in sociology, in philosophy, etc. looking at those kinds of debates. And the question that I've had is how do you, as an institutional bureaucrat at the center, introduce a debate on decoloniality when you're not the expert in the discipline. So what we've done is demanded within the year every single program will have an engagement and reflection with students, undergraduate and postgraduate, with professionals, with people from the outside, with professors, uh, and the idea, and alumni. And you meant to deliberate on the questions. And you meant to grapple with the issues and come. Now the problem I have with the debate is it happens at a high level of abstraction rather than in the detail. One of the most powerful debates that, for instance, Ashil Mbembe puts out, and he's a professor at WITS, he puts forward, is that the fundamental notion of the liberal arts degree is to make you uncomfortable and teach you what you don't know. Too much of the demands of student protesters is we want to learn what we we're comfortable with. What does that say about the pedagogy of teaching and the pedagogy of learning? Those are fundamental questions that we have to kind of confront. And I'm not so sure we're doing this sufficiently in this context. And so I think that there's a real debate to be had. And I think in the last year, we've changed 32 subject matters about pro and adverts. But it's, it, it's in, the, in the detail, in the nuances. And actually, uh, that's where the interesting thing comes. I've had, I don't think the answer is what some of the leadership has told me. Some of the leadership is saying to me, we don't want to learn neoclassical economics. We want to only learn Marxist economics. That's not what, where the learning is going to happen. And it seems to me that we need to open up a serious discussion on this. On the issue of... Reflection on the party dynamic, again in the book. What is interesting about 2015 and 2016, in 2015 is it's very much a social movement. It's very much a movement beyond party, beyond class, beyond race. It pulls out tens of thousands. In 2016, it becomes factionalized. And partly it becomes factionalized by political parties. Because when this movement achieves what it does, Suddenly, every political party wants to control the movement. So the ruling party wants to control it because it's become an embarrassment. The EFF wants to control it because it wants to launch, use it as a launch. And what we find in 2016 is the factionalization around party life and the difficulty in engaging student leaders. So in 2016, before the security comes in, we decided to embark on an engagement with the students and a, and a negotiation. And I convinced the Senate and the Council 
to march with me. The council is uh, the equivalent of your board of governors. Uh, to march with me in favor of free education to the Constitutional Court. And that was not accepted by the student leadership because one faction didn't want to agree to it. And they didn't want to do agree to it because effectively they had launched a campaign to, against Jacob Zuma. And a settlement at the university would have undermined that agreement. And so in a sense, the party dynamic becomes very, very powerful. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. I find very powerful, I don't know the US well enough, its institutions, but one of the things that I find quite striking about the US, UK and Europe is their parties are not so heavily represented in the student life of the institution. In South Africa, the parties are the dominant political expression in the student life, the political expression, and that's something that I worry about. Uh, and then finally, security. <laughs> there is, you know, if you told me when I started in 2013, you would be the vice chancellor that brings in the police. I would have said never happened. In 2015 and 2016, in 2016, I brought in the police. If you ask me again, um, would you do it again? And I'll tell you, yes, I would. That's the point. And student leaders don't like hearing this. And that's why I'm, I'm, I've been in quite a battle with it. And that's why, in part, I'm writing this. And it really takes me back to a debate that happens in the 1960s um, between Marcusa and Adonis. And really, it's about trying to understand the security freedom dilemma. And Ashil Mbembe reflects on this. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a small piece that he writes in, in, in 2016. And what he makes up is that what happens in the notion of a democracy? Everybody, if, if basically there were 40, 24 petrol bombs that we found on the campus in 2016, I can guarantee you without that security, that campus would have burnt. And then the legacy of generations of students would have been severely compromised. It's two and a half billion worth of infrastructure, is there? And the question you have to ask is does freedom mean that you never have security? And does security mean, the presence of security mean that freedom is never possible? What is the dynamic relationship that emerges between freedom and security in institutional settings and in society as a whole. And it's a, it's, it's a conundrum that has never been truly grappled with by progressives. And so we've left the arena open for the conservatives to dominate this debate on the dilemma between freedom and security. And it seems to me that this isn't the first time that this has happened. By the way, I walk, up, I walk in Harvard. You have a police force. We don't have a police force at Gavinus. We have a Harvard police. We don't have. We have a much more lower level security uh, uh, process. You have a challenge in American institutions around shootings. What is the dilemma that that poses around freedom and security? And how do you structure the relationship between that? And I think that that's the debate that I grapple with in, in this thing. I would argue that's the thing that vice chancellors have had to grapple with in South Africa. And that's where I think that, that student activists have never truly confronted, and frankly, left-wing academics have never truly confronted. If somebody died, I would have had that on my responsibility for the rest of my life, as would have anybody by vice chancellor. How do you avoid that? That's the freedom security dilemma that we have to confront. Thank you, Adam.